Hi guys, Alec Pierce, Vintage Scuba. Here I am with another of my two hose, special two hose series. And this is a, this is a really neat one. This is very special. Well, they're all special. That's why I'm doing them, right? Anyway, <laughs> this is really special. I want to take a moment and uh, tell you, give you a bit of history. First of all, this is a U.S. Divers or Aqualung regulator. Uh, specifically for you collectors, this is called the Overpressure Breathing regulator, uh, commonly designated as the DX. If you're a collector, you know what a DX regulator is. I'm going to come back to this in just a moment, but let me tell you just a story. 54 or 55, this reg was made in 1954, 1955. It only was made for two years. Everybody thinks, of course, that U.S. Divers was a U.S. company, and it was. Everybody thinks, of course, that Aqualung is part of U.S. Divers, and it is, but it wasn't. Everybody thinks that the Aqualung, the first regular, was invented by Jacques Cousteau, but it wasn't. Let me give you a bit of history. First of all, the regulators, you, regulators were being made in France at the time. Not very many. We're talking the late 40s, mid to late 40s, very early 50s. They were made in France by a company called Spiro Technique, which was owned partially by Jacques Cousteau and some others as well. In 1948, a Frenchman by the name of Emile Gagnon came to Canada, immigrated to Canada, went to Montreal, naturally enough, he was French. And he was working for a big company called Air Liquide. He was an engineer. Yeah, he built things. He made things. You see where the story's going? Anyway, uh, he was contacted and agreed to work for Air Liquide. And uh, through an arrangement was Spiro Technique. And Emile Gagnon took the French-made regulator, which was good, but it had some issues. And being an engineer, he improved it. He made it good. He developed the actual Aqualung that we all uh, know and use today. That's right. It was not Emile Gagnon. Now, Emile Gagnon, it was not Jacques Cousteau. Emile and Jacques did have a partnership. Uh, in that partnership, to a large extent, to a very large extent, I'm not saying that Jacques Cousteau did not give ideas to Emile and Emile used them in back and forth. It was a partnership. And, there were, of course, they worked together. But generally speaking, the responsibilities in that partnership were that Emile Gagnon Emil Gagnon built the devices. He was an engineer. You never saw him on the, in the movies or on TV. Yeah, they had TV. Uh, <laughs> he was the guy that built this thing. Jacques Cousteau was the uh, front, front man. You know what I mean? His picture was on everything. Jacques Cousteau, you know, on the movies and the films and the silent world. And he was the one that you saw with his divers diving with this regulator. But he didn't, was not... He was not the inventor, per se. So having included that little mystery, uh, let me go on to another little bit of history. At about the same time, there was another gentleman by the name of René Buzo, B-U-Z-Z-O, René Buzo, who uh, 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 was aware of the French-made regulator, and he was a businessman, and he saw opportunities for it. So, and he was based in Canada. Yeah, he was Canadian, based in Canada. And uh, for a variety of reasons, marketing reasons at the particular time, it was very difficult to, uh, for the United States, any company in the United States, to import regulars directly from France. Realize this was just a couple of years after the war. I'm not sure the exact reasons, but you couldn't do that. So René Buzo imported them into Canada. Yeah. Actually, he imported parts, and he assembled them. He assembled these in Canada. In fact, the very first Aqualung regulators are made in Canada. It says right on them, made in Canada. If you have one of those, it's very, very rare. I've seen a few. I've actually held a couple of my hands. I do not have one. A Aqualung, already Aqualung regulator made in Canada. Pretty neat. Anyway, it didn't take too long before Rene realized that uh, the real market for scuba diving equipment, it wasn't called that, but for Aqualungs, was in the United States. And so and that wasn't very long before he moved to uh, L.A., and uh, the rest is history. U.S. Divers was born, the Aqualung name became famous, and the regulators that uh, Emile Gagnon actually invented, actually developed, and that René Buzo brought to North America, the first ones actually in North America had made in France on them, and um, uh, they became famous and took over the world, took over the world of scuba diving anyway. Huh? This is a very early one. 54, 55. This reg was made for only two years. 1954, 1955. Now, there were earlier regulators than this, a couple of them. 
Uh, and they were very, very simple regulators. This one offered a couple of interesting features. And uh, you collectors will recognize this, and I'm going to point out some of them right now. First of all, it was pretty straightforward, as most of the regulators then were. A plain, ordinary, satin finish uh, uh, top box. That's what this half of the body, the intake half, is called. It had a nicely chromed uh, bottom box, the exhaust half. And I have mentioned in some of my earlier uh, videos, the nameplate, the model nameplate on this regulator, as most of them were for many, many years, before and after this for many years, uh, from Aqualung and from Voigt and many other companies as well. The nameplate is a piece of metal. It's impressed with the information, often painted different colors, red, blue, black, in this case, yellow. And then it was riveted, actually riveted to the uh, bottom box by four little brass rivets. You can see that there. So that right away tells you this is an older regulator. A couple other things that will tell you that uh, if you're not a collector, uh, this tells you some, gives you some ideas as to how collectors know this is an old regulator. Here. Take a look here, uh, Kevin, at the exhaust spigot. We'll call this a spigot. See this piece that goes through the exhaust holes? Now you may notice that right here, this, this is actually detachable. This exhaust spigot is held on by two screws to the body. Later models, in fact, very soon after this, uh, those later models, that wasn't the case. The spigot was attached, welded right to the box, like this one, the intake. But this particular one, can you see the screws there? You can see it's detachable. So it's had a detachable exhaust, that's what it's called, and that means it's a very early regulator. Okay? Now, what else makes it uh, special? Well, this also had the early clips to hold the body together. These are those terrible, terrible clips. I may have mentioned them before. These little metal clips, there's seven of them. If you haven't lost them, most regulators uh, have lost a few. They could have five, six, seven. <laughs> seven is the right number. That was what was put on them. And these clips held the two boxes together and squeezed the diaphragm. And uh, they worked really well when they put it together and they squeezed them. Oh, good, out it goes. <laughs> the problem was when you went to service the regulator, these clips had to come off. You had to check the diaphragm, replace the exhaust seal, and reset the inside. So these clips all had to come off. They are impossible to get off. Certainly very, very difficult to get off without scratching the body. Now, we're very fortunate here. I hope that the buyer of this regulator, I'll be shipping this out shortly, appreciates the fact that this body is completely unmarked. Very, very rare. Most bodies uh, have little scratches, some nice big scratches or dents right where those clips are as uh, ham-fisted service people have struggled to get those darn clips off. There is a way to get them off, but it's uh, tricky and it's not in the, it's not in the uh, uh, service manual, trust me. And then you've got to get it back on too. But anyway, that's one way of not. Another way you can tell this is an old one is that the way these, these uh, hoses are attached to the spigots. You see here, let's take this hose off. I always keep these hoses loose so they don't, the rubber doesn't stick to the metal. You see this little clip? I'm going to actually do a special little seminar just on these clips. They're called Tinnerman. In fact, if you look very closely, you can see the word Tinnerman. That's T-I-N-N-E-R-M-A-N. Tinner man. Tinnerman clips. Very popular years and years ago. I don't even know if they're still made anymore. Maybe they are. But uh, these are old because they have tenement clips and even older because these tenement clips are green. Yeah, they're painted green or black. So we know that these are particularly old ones. Later they were chrome, very pretty chrome. But that means this is an old regular. Well, what's special? And if you caught this earlier, I called this the overpressure breathing regular. What's that all about? Well, that also makes it very special. And that's why this regulator is very rare and very collectible. Most regulators, when you breathe in, suck on the intake hose, this hose over here, the diaphragm collapses into the body, pushes the lever, and air is delivered into the body, and that air, you suck that air through that big hose. That's the way they work. Well, I think we've discussed that before. And it works pretty well. All regulators work just like that, except for this one. Yeah. This one was unique. U.S. divers, and I don't know who was doing this. I don't know if it was Sam LeCoq, a good friend of mine who died recently, uh, inventor and founder of Sportsways, or if it was Emil Gagnon. I don't know who, who was involved in this, but it was a pretty slick idea. What they did for the DX, overpressure breathing regulator, was they ran a small hose, a small airline. I'm going to pull this off just a little bit, Kevin. You have to zoom in here. Down the middle of the main intake hose, can I get this off without hurting it? There we go. Pull that off a little wee bit. You look inside that hose. See it? 
Do you see something in there? Yeah, green hose. There's a green hose. It's a small hose. That's about a half an inch in diameter. It's a green pressure hose, a low pressure hose. It's not very high pressure. Let me put this back on here carefully. And here we go. And that green hose is connected to the jet inside. So with this regulator, when you suck the diaphragm in, it pushes on the lever, and the air comes out, goes into that green hose. Yeah. And that green hose goes right down the intake tube, and it goes right into this special. You know what's a mouthpiece? It's a special mouthpiece. Now, nah, here, get your, get your zoomer on there. Your zoomer? Is that what that's called? Yeah, that's what we call it now. Get your zoomer. Look inside. And you see a little metal pipe in there? Three holes. Three holes. That's exactly right. That green hose comes all the way down. It connects to the end of that metal pipe. And there's three holes. So the air travels through that little blows right into your mouth. Yeah, it's pretty neat. So when you suck in this, now air came through the big hose as well. But the majority of the air was pushed through what was called the nozzle. It went through the green hose all the way down the intake and into that nozzle. And it blasted right into your mouth. So when you sucked in, you go, whoo, you got a nice blast of air. Great idea. Really good. And then when you exhausted it, it went out through the exhaust hose the normal way. But that was extremely special. It made this regulator a very unique regulator. Did it make it good? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of mixed feelings on that. These regulators were not exactly what you call easy breathers to begin with. So when you start playing around and putting accessories and trying to improve the breathing without changing the basic design, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Kind of like putting a four-barrel curb on a Honda Civic. Hey, it'll probably still run. Does it run better? Yeah, I'm not so sure. Do you know what a four-barrel curb is? Maybe these people don't. I don't know. Anyway, so the point to all that is that most of these, a lot of these anyway, were changed back to a standard regulator. Yeah, the little green hose and the nozzle and the mouthpiece really didn't work too well. So a lot of these were changed back. You just pull off the green hose, change the mouthpiece back to a standard U.S. diver's mouthpiece, which meant that you actually turn this regulator into a plain, good old standard Mistral or, uh, or green, uh, no, not green label, but a Mistral, U.S. diver's Mistral regulator. So to find one like this, 1954 and made on Broxton Avenue because this reg was made on Broxton Avenue. U.S. divers moved from Broxton to uh, I think it was Delhi Avenue in 1955. This was made in 1954. Label indicates all of that. Just a fine one like this in such neat, con nice, nice condition. Almost new. The hoses are still flexible with the original special DX over breathing mouthpiece, the original green hose, the original Tinnaman clamps, all in great condition. No. Very, very seldom. Very seldom. unrestored. This is the way it was delivered from the factory. It makes it very special. I hope you enjoyed that. Especially you collectors out there. I can see you out there licking your lips. <laughs> it's, it is a real beauty, and it is gone. Anyway, there you go. Another special regulator from Alec Pierce at Vintage Scuba. I hope you enjoyed that. If you have any comments or questions, send them on in. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.